Welcome back everybody. Now I'll probably be talking a little softly in this video. I have a throat that is recovering. Um, I caught some sort of head cold and still having some issues with it, so forgive me if I sound a little unenthusiastic. Uh, but I'd like to make this video today talking about async await. And this is directly inspired by the video that Fun Fun Function made about is async await useless? I'll link that video in the description in case somehow you haven't seen it already. I just generally assume if you're watching my channel, you probably are watching larger channels, but there's probably some people out there who haven't seen it. So check out that video if you haven't already. What I'll be doing here is introducing async functions for anyone who isn't familiar to them. Compare them with promises uh, using dot then chaining and then we'll just discuss how I think you might use async await in conjunction with dot then. I don't think they're quite as opposed as perhaps it was presented in the fun fun function video. So let's talk about it. First thing, I have an async function here. I've just called it main. I'm going, I have an asynchronous function that returns a promise down here. We'll get to that momentarily. But to start out, we have this async function. And one important thing to note is that if I console log a return value from this, so main currently doesn't do anything. It just takes an input and returns that input. So if I give it 42 and then I console log, 40, or console log the output, you might expect that the result would be 42. But it's actually 42 wrapped in a promise. And so that's a key thing to understand about asynchronous functions is that they're another bit of syntax around promises, but they're not an alternative syntax for promise chains. These serve largely a different purpose, and it has to do with, at least in my interpretation of how you would use it, lexical scoping. So let's start first by getting rid of the async part, and we'll just do some work with our asynchronous function down here. So this asynchronous function returns a promise, and all it does is after one second, it just returns the value that you passed in, wrapped in a promise, incremented by one. So nothing too crazy. Let's go back here, and we'll just run it as a process. Not really worry about that. And let's see. Let's do something like uh, const. We'll just call it y, because creativity. And we'll pass in, I guess, 42. Now, as we know, we can't just then console log y. We won't get the value that we expect. Well, we do if we know how promises work. But if you were trying to write this in a synchronous style, where you go from making a function call, assigning that return to the return value to a variable, and then console logging that variable, you won't get what you expect. So if we run this, we're just going to get a pending promise. Oh, and then undefined because I forgot to remove this console log. Oops. So if I run this again without that extra console log, we get the pending promise immediately. And then after a one second delay, the application or program ends. So what's actually happening here is async or the ink async immediately resolves, or sorry, immediately returns a pending promise, assigns it to Y, and then we console log that pending promise. Now, if you're familiar with promises, you know that how we would actually console log the return value is by calling dot then, and then passing console log, or a function with console log inside of it, but we can just pass in console log because console log is a function. So if we run this now, now we just see 43. And that's because what dot then allows us to do is lift a function inside of the monad. So not to make it sound too scary, but promises are monadic. And essentially that means you put a value inside of the monad, inside of the promise, or you wrap a promise around a value. And then any transformation that occurs on that value has to occur within the monad. You can't fall out of it. 
And so dot then is what would be considered dot chain or dot bind in other languages or other paradigms or even other monads in the same language. And it simply lifts a function from operating on values to operating on values inside of a monad. So console log, it doesn't know anything about the promise monad. But, so it can't, it can't console log out 43. But with the help of dot then, dot then says, all right, I'll take your function console log and I'll apply it to the return value of ink async, which happens to be 43. So that's what we get. The problem, or the problem, the perceived problem that async await tries to solve is that this creates a new lexical context. So consider that you wanted to share some variable or share some values. So if you create a new function and it's going to receive the return value, and then you let's just say console log x, right? This is the this is the exact same thing as what we just had. It just makes it a bit more obvious that we've created a new lexical scope for this in the context of the dot then. So if we have a return, if we have a value at this point, and then we have another then call. Oops. And we have another cog dot then. We if we want to share any values between these two calls, because they're in separate functions that are not nested, we actually have to pass the values along the promise chain. And that get the promise chain allowed us to get away from the you know uh, callback hell where you've got all this nesting occurring. But the downside there is that then you can't share context because you lose that nesting. And because JavaScript is lexically scoped, you can't share values between these different function calls. But with async await, what it allows you to do is as long as you call a function with async, you can use await to the left instead of to the right, like with dot then, to the left of an asynchronous call. And that's going to stop the program from assigning the value to y until that promise has resolved. It's then going to, instead of lifting a function into the promise monad, it's going to extract the value from the monad and assign it to y. So that comes with some benefits and it comes with some downsides. First of all, let's make sure that I'm not lying to you. There we go, we get 43. So this looks like synchronous code, right? And on the happy path, this works just fine. You can essentially write all of your code as if it were synchronous. So if we were to make another value, call it Z, and we just increment Y, whoa, not like that. Increment Y, and then I guess we would probably want to console log the new value. then we get the new value. So we, using promises, we return the, val the resolved value from ink async into y, and then we use that new value as the value itself, not as a promise, inside of as ink async. That returns a new promise, await strips the value out, signs it to z, and then we console log z. We could do this the same way with a promise chain, so we could do uh, ink async, and then that's just going to apply ink async twice to the initial value. So once at the initial call here, that's gonna produce a promise. You can call dot then on a promise. It won't execute this function until the value has resolved. Extract the value, or lift the ink async function into the monad so we can operate on the value itself, produce 44, and then the entire thing will be returned as a promise. Await will extract the 44 out, assign it to y, and then we can console log y down here. So that still works the same way. And this pattern, we'll get to error handling in a second, and that's why I prefer this pattern. This pattern, based on my limited exposure to async await, is how I think you should probably 
use async await. Not in the way I showed a second ago, so this way. Unless these are unless these cannot be chained, these two operations, unless they cannot be chained, they are entirely unrelated. I would say that this is the this is not the preferred way to do program design or application design using asynchronous operations. I would say it's probably better to do something like this, where you get all of the benefits of having a monadic asynchronous operation. So you get all of the chaining benefits to the right of await, and then you can only treat a selection of your code as being uh, imperative. So I'll show you why this matters. Because first of all, at first you might think, well, the version, this version, looks very simple. I would prefer to do that. I would argue that this will actually be better in a second. So we'll go back to here. And that's because when we get to error handling, things get a little funky. So if we just throw a reject on here, right? So now we're just going to trigger a reject. Everything's going to start yelling at us that we don't have catch, which means that we have to handle this error at some point. The benefit of having a promise chain is that you can throw a catch on there. And then we can do something like console.error, because we're going to handle this super well. And at least then we'll handle the error as it gets to that point. This means that console.error is not going to return anything, so y would just be undefined. So what we could do is something like error, and then we could return, uh, actually, I guess we'll do, we have to do something funky. So let's do, oops. We're going to clean this up in a second, don't worry. So this should work just fine. It's going to console log the error and then, or console.error the error and then return the error as the value for y, which obviously we don't want. That's misinformation. And then console log it again. Let's see if this works properly. There we go. So at least now we're, we're catching the error. So we don't get an unhandled promise rejection warning. And that's the benefit. This error propagation is the benefit of having the promise chain. Any error that occurs along the promise chain gets just passed up to the single catch. And as long as you make a valid error statement, this is very beneficial. It gives you very clear information and it handles it very elegantly. Obviously, when you deal with async await, you'll see that all the examples use try catch. And I would argue that you actually want to limit that to your main process, which is why I've called this main. So if in each file you create a main process, and those are async await functions, then all of the calls can be to other functions and you can, or to other modules, or just create a promise chain itself. And either you create the promise chain directly or in those sub modules, you are trying to use promise chains whenever possible. And then returning from either an async function or from within, or you just return a promise chain. So let me show you that's what that might look like. So here's module, we'll say module one. And then here we can do module two. So, oops, we'll just call this, this will be another function. Can't type function today for some reason. This will be another main function. And so now we need to handle this error. So first of all, let's set it up so that we're actually going to be calling main from another main. So let's just assign the value y to main, and then we'll console log main, or console log y, sorry. So instead of returning it, or instead of console logging it up here, we'll just return it. So nothing super fancy, but it'll, uh, it'll serve its purpose in a second. Okay, so let's just make sure that the behavior has stayed the same. Where am I console? It must be this here. Yes, because I need to await that. Okay, so to explain what's happening so far, we're calling 
ink async on 42. That creates a prom or that creates 43 wrapped in a promise. Dot then ink async creates 44 wrapped in a promise, except that well, that would be true, except that we're rejecting. So this actually throws an error. The error is 43, so let's make this more obvious. Uh, let's go something truly horrible. So now if we run this, you get two messages, something truly horrible. And that's because something truly horrible gets thrown in the first call, and that gets passed all the way to catch. We console.error that, then we return it. Then we return it here, that wraps it in a new promise because await stripped it out. So that it's just the string. When we return from an async function, remember that wraps it in a promise. So that gets passed up to module two. It's currently that string, something truly horrible, wrapped in a promise. Await strips it out, assigns it to y, and then we console log it and we see the value twice, okay? But if this was actually an error, we want to handle it properly. So one of the commenters referenced Go, and I've written a little bit of Go as well, and I actually liked their solution. So it would be something like, if you use a bit of destructuring, you could do something like error and Y. So this would be your value, change this to an actual, call it value. And then here, what we can do is instead of having a catch, actually, I don't know if they suggested this, but this is how I'm going to say we should do it. Here, we need to have some value that's, or some uh, operation that will either take the value and wrap it in a pair that will be destructured into an error and a value, error of null and a value, or if the error has occurred, wrap the error in a pair so that we can return it and track and handle the error. And so the way that we can do that is we can just say, well, actually, let's just do x, because why not? And then we can do null, and that will get destructured into error or x. And then the second argument to dot then is the catch. So we can then do error, return, and we'll just wrap it like that. So that, now we can do something like if error, or however you want to check that there's an error, return, and then we can do whatever our handle error is going to be. So in this module, it's going to just be called here handle one, handle error one. And let's just write that. So function, I think I've spelled function wrong about four different times, four different ways in this video. Uh, so here handle error one, and this will take an error. And all we'll do to handle it is just console log error in module one. And that error was error. And then we can return error. Okay, so now this will return an error wrapped in the pair, which means that we can also do the same thing and handle that here. So we can do error and value. Oh, and I'll need to change this to value. Oops, value. And we'll do the exact same error handling here, except instead of error handle one or handle error one, we handle error two. And same thing here, oops. be in module two. <laughs> Node run. Node run. There we go. So now we've got an error occurred in module one. The error was something truly horrible. Error occurred in module two, something truly horrible. Now obviously all we're doing is just passing the error from the call, the place where the error occurred into the module that actually called the module where the error occurred but it allows us to handle the error however we want. 
So if we need to log this somewhere, then we could log it. We're, we're deciding to continue passing the error along, but we could potentially terminate there if we needed to. Now this is a little bit gross, having to write that. So I would say that what you could do is make something like a wrap function. I'm just going to call it wrap. You could call it whatever you want. And it would just take your value and it's just going to return null for the error and then the value as the second uh, element of the pair. And then there's another misspelling of function. Uh, we could do something like handle just because catch will throw an error which is a shame because catch would be a better name. Return error. Let's call that error. Which means then we can just go up here and at the end of each promise chain we could just call wrap and we could call handle. And that allows us to handle any errors. And that means that we only have to do this if error on the main process. So the main process will be where all of our, all the lexical scoping of shared variables needs to, it can occur. And everything that doesn't need to be shared can be done in a pure functional style inside of our promise chain. So if a wait was just calling some function, so let's just say some function, and it was going to take 42, and then that some function contained an entire promise chain, that's going to, and then just returned that promise chain. So I'll actually show you what that would look like. Function, some function, x, return, did something like this, then this is just going to very easily be, a, be treated as a promise chain and then just return its value as a pair which can be destructured in the main process. And it keeps the main process focused specifically on imperative style code while the functions that do most of the work are focused entirely on functional style of programming so that you get all the benefits of the monad inside of your functional code and you get your top level error handling where you need the lexical scoping sharing, lexical scoping sharing, lexical environment sharing in your main process. And if you have, a, if you have one module that has its main process, it can be called by another module. And because async functions return promises around their values, then you can treat that delegation to a submodule just as any other value wrapped around a promise would be and just call await and then destructure that as well. So let's go up here. This would need to be wrapped, yes. We need to wrap our return value here. And first of all, let's just see how, how this goes. Everything blows up. Some function is not defined. I probably spelled it wrong. I have a tendency of doing that today. Also the problem when you're gonna write, there we go, a bunch of code without your linter so that it doesn't yell at you for all the things you're doing wrong. Uh, it makes it harder to spot errors, which is why linters are great. Uh, so now what we'll do is stop rejecting and we'll see if this works properly. So instead, we will resolve So we're expecting 44, Let's see if we get that. There we go, we get 44. And we only console log that once. And so what we're doing is we are in, this is our, our main module. Think of this as maybe your index.js or whatever. And we have this sub-module. It's just called main because these are all existing in the same scope, so name sharing wouldn't work. Uh, but this would be presumably called main and it would be in your, you know, index.js, and then this would be called main in some other sub-module. Anyway, this one calls main, and then main delegates to this function that has a promise chain. And it just takes an input and returns that new value or error 
wrapped accordingly, uh, either transformed or handled, and returns it up to the shared lexical scope for that submodule. You're then able to catch the error and handle it accordingly or return the successful value because we are doing this destructuring to make and excuse me to make error handling easier we have to wrap the value before we pass it back to the true main process and then if there was an error we need to handle it there as well otherwise we are just going to console log the value and because there were no errors it just got passed all the way up the promise chain back into value here then we returned it and we wrapped it then we passed it up to here it got destructured out as value so remember it was wrapped in a promise await extracting it assigned it to a value this didn't trigger so we're fine and then we console log the value itself and remember if we were to return from this async function it would again be wrapped in a value or in a promise so we would have to call await or dot then on it wherever it got called so a couple things to note that make this application design possible. Async functions return prom values wrapped in promises. That's important. Anything to the right of await gets evaluated first. So that's why you can do an entire promise chain. So if we wanted to, we could step in before this and we could call you know, ink async again. This would cause a problem just because this is going to be wrapped. We have this wrapped value here. Uh, but we could get around it. We could just destructure it here and then call it. But this will be evaluated first before the await is called. So we can do as much promise chaining as we want, which is how I recommend it. And then we call await that, goes, that extracts the value out from the promise and assigns it into the value here. But you'll always be in a promise because as soon as you try to return that value out of the async function, that will wrap it once again in a promise. So hopefully that gave you some ideas to how async await and promises in as far as dot then can actually be used together and why it doesn't actually make sense to say promises versus async await because async await uses promises and promises are promises. So they're all the, they're all the same thing. It's just that dot then lifts functions into, a, into the promise and await extracts values out of the promise. But because they're only available in async functions, and async functions return promises, you're always in a promise. So you can't really escape from the monad. That's the whole point. Anyway, hope you learned something from the video, or at least found this somewhat insightful or helpful or entertaining or something. Uh, why, how, why ever you watch these videos, hopefully you got that out of it. And uh, let me know if this sound gets super echoey or terrible in some way. I have a new microphone and I don't know what I'm doing. So I appreciate if any audio files can give me some suggestions. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.